yourself and Sue, who's the boss? I'm the boss's husband, but uh, she likes to think she's boss. But when it comes to a final decision, I can assure you, I've got trousers on. Who is the boss? Me. Who's the best horseman or woman, you or her? Well, without a doubt, you, I mean, that's a silly question again, isn't it? You're putting male against female again, aren't you? I mean, how naughty can you get? Who's the best horseman or woman, you or Harvey? Him. I've known the world over for what I am and how I am and how I ride, so it, it's no good trying to class me with somebody else. A summary of the iconic training partnership that is Sue and Harvey Smith in just 30 seconds. Important to note, it is Sue Smith's name that is on the training license. A woman of few words, but with a rare natural horsemanship that has led her from the Smith's Bingley Moor base to the winner's enclosures at both Aintree and Cheltenham. While Harvey, a household name in the 70s and 80s for his show jumping achievements, is famous for many things, but being short on words and opinions has never been one of them throughout an extraordinary career. Well, it all set off early days in a 21 foot caravan that cost 150 quid. 1961, when I got married, I left the building site. Uh, at that stage, I had 20 men under me and I couldn't have five shillings an hour. So I went in the office and said, well, you can lick them and stick them. I'm getting married and I'm off. And I got married and set course on a show jumping trail. And that's how it all started. And I had three stables and three horses. How did you start riding? Because that wasn't in the family necessarily. No, my brother had a pony to start with. He had a horse and, and he had a, a little black pony and he used to ride that a bit. And then I went to the local farm down here, Jack Baker, and he had a milk pony called Simon and played about with it and got it jumping poles. And I used to go down to Bingley deliver the milk with it in the morning, and then we used to play about with the pony in the afternoon. And uh, it sort of worked on quietly from there, and that was like 1947, 48 time. You became one of the best of the best in that show jumping world, but you, you always felt a little bit like a, an outsider, did you or not? Uh, well, I always had a will of my own. Um, whether the saddle on it or not a saddle, it didn't used to matter to me. I mean, you've seen the picture in the kitchen of me and, and one of the lads. There's a picture with me and two of the lads on, on a horse with both no saddles, but riding out when one's about two and the other's about three. It was just natural instinct to us. Completely natural, completely natural balance. And luckily, both the lads developed the same. They had the same carry on. Your two boys who yeah. went on to be very good show jumpers. Yeah. But... And I think we're the only, only family that father and two sons both gone to the Olympics. So we keep breaking records all round, you know, one way or another, trying anyway. I won the leading show jumper in 1958 and I won the national championship in 1958, both with the same horse, Farmer's Boy. It cost 33 guineas in York, which is roughly 40 quid. And I had a wagon that cost 50 quid. And actually, in those days, we went round cleaning all the championships up, cleaning all the major prizes up, including the leading show jumper and the national championship. So that, that's, how, that's how life started. It, you know, when they say, Jack Berry used to say, it's tough at the top, it's even tougher at the bottom, but if you keep fighting, you'll get there. That, that aspect of you coming in and, and, and sticking it to the, the establishment, if you like, that's, that's kind of stayed with you and it's been part of your persona. Is that... Is that real that all of that well i find a lot especially now getting on on in years the establishments they are run by people who haven't got the knowledge of the people who's participating in the sports like when it was show jumping you got get people who'd never ever ridden a show jumper making rules to stop you try winning you're getting racing people going into meetings Looking around the, the room, there's one person in there that understands what they're talking about, and there's 10 or 12 others which don't. And any rule that comes up, they all vote in favour of it. And the one person who knows what he's talking about gets kicked up the backside. So you'll find that all those people gradually disintegrate. They go out of the job, and all you're left them with is your academics that don't understand the sports. I have to ask you, Harvey, because I remember reading 
your biography when I, when I when I was a bit younger, V is for victory, and it was called V is for victory because you you famously gave the V sign, the two fingers salute to. Well, you tell us, was it was it to the judges at Hickstead as as everyone thought, and the the rumor was that everyone was annoyed with you because you held on to the trophy from the previous year and you didn't bring it because you knew you'd take it back with you again and there was no point. That's correct. I, I met Bunny, you know, and <coughs> I said to him, he said, oh, have you brought the cup back? I said, oh, Bunny, I've forgotten it. I said, don't worry about it, I'll win it again. <laughs> and he said, you've got no chance with that horse. You have absolutely no chance. Anyways, I jumped around and I had a fence down. And the minute I had a fence down, him on his balcony and all his cronies all cheered. And I'm going out of the ring, I thought, you and anyways, there was only one other had four faults, and that was Steve Hadley. Anyways, he went in the jump off and had a fence down, and I went in the jump off and jumped clear. And then when I went past his balcony, I couldn't help saluting him with the greatest of ease. What you did that day, though, I think appealed to a lot of fans of the sport because a lot of us were rooting for you because a you were really good at what you did you were a fabulous uh, rider but b you, you were slightly unorthodox and you had this edge to you this character that you it felt like you were a bit of a a bit of a rebel well i think from the early days the word bricklayer i was the working man's man from that day onwards i was the working man's man and they backed me choose whoever else was there they were back in the working man and that is that is one of the greatest achievements I had, that I had the, the public with me. When you first met Harvey, can you remember that? Oh, definitely. <laughs> Who'd forget? Uh, Hickstead, really. Uh, we had this big uh, chestnut horse that I was riding in the novice classes, and um, himself and Trevor Banks came and asked if uh, he was for sale, and sort of that was really the first time I met him, really. Who made the running between you and Harvey? How did, how, how did you, you come to be together? Well, I don't know. I suppose it was a bit of both, really. <laughs> um, it's, a, it's a difficult... It's, it's just a, a thing that went on, and, and I suppose if you're attracted to one another, that's how it happens, you know. It was... Uh, it, well, I've, still, I've been here 37 years now, so there must have been some attraction there, so I'm still here now anyway, so... That was how we met, that was down at Hickstead. And how, how big a factor have, have horses been in, in bringing the two of you two, two, two together? Could you, could you be together if you were not both no, so I, involved in I horses? Think, I think basically horses, because uh, I was just mad about horses, ponies, horses, anything, I was mad about them. And uh, I suppose, yeah, it's been a, it has been a big factor um, because we agree to disagree and, and so on and so forth over what happens with horses how you ride them and uh, you know I've, I've learned a huge amount off of Harvey as regards of horses since I've been up here um, probably it, he wouldn't admit it but he's learned one or two things off of me as well your dad had race horses so that came more from you would you say the decision to to go into training race horses uh, well the decision was at the time um, I think Harvey uh, when I was first up here um, father had these horses in a couple of different places down south and one was very close to him and Harvey had gone away to a show I think in Holland somewhere and father said uh, come on we're going to have a look at the racehorses while while you're here and things weren't going as they were planned at the yard this horse was lame and that horse had a problem and so on and uh, when Harvey rang that night I said to him what have you been doing I said we went to see the racehorses and, well, I said, not very happy, he says he's going to take them all away and that's the end of that job. Oh, tell him not to panic, not to panic. He said, we'll take them up with us. And that's exactly, more or less, how it started. So almost on a whim, you know, a snap decision to yeah, but take that, these horses on. Yeah, but that is, that's Harvey. We used to train them and they used to go to George Moore and they used to run them on the track, you know. He'd take them for a fortnight before the race. And, and run them and, and we had a lot, of, a lot of success that way. And then a pal of ours, uh, David Stevenson, said, um, why don't you take a license out? Because we had a conditional license to start with, then we took a proper license out. And um, 
then she took a proper licence out, but it wasn't like today, you just got to go to London, prove you got the money and to, could do the job and you knew what horse looked like, and you got a licence today. I mean, there's that many rules and regulations, these poor fellows that are trying to get licences, well, I mean, and it's st the stopped by people who don't understand the job anyway. He said to me, you take the licence, so that was it. I, I went to London and I took the licence. Um, early days, we both rode. Um, so that, and we only had very few horses, so it was a much easier job. Um, we used to do a lot of work on the moor because we didn't have a gallop or anything like that. But it works if you give a horse, if you've got the facility like we have with the moor and the grassland that we had, that helped us a great deal. In terms of the training now, Harvey, I would assume, because you, you, you both have that jumping, show jumping background, that jumping is something you do a lot of work on. Is, is that right or not? Yeah, they've got to be, in my book, they've got to be jumping fit as well as race fit. Uh, we spend a lot of time, you see, people today don't have the time. They go to the sales and all the owners want the modern owners that's come into the job now, they want instant success. Where the older owners would buy a nice young horse and wait for it to be made. Whereas now we're going to the sales and buying 10 or 12 horses, storing them, making them, put them on the track, then sell them. And then the owner has got something ready to go with. Whereas normally they're going to Newmarket now and buying these things that's been flat racing, which don't really stand national hunt racing. Some do, but very few. And to me, it's a wrong policy, but, but that's the way of the world, you know, that they want instant success. Without giving away trade secrets, when, when you go and look at a young horse, what are you, what are you looking for? Well, uh, a lot of confirmation. I mean, you look at any any athlete, any anything, you see these marathon runners, or you see the sprinters they all move perfectly and if you get a horse that moves perfectly and his, his frame is right then you've got something to work on and if you've got a bit of breeding as well I never look at the breeding of anything until I've seen the person I look at the person I like you I've bought horses and, and I know I bought horses in Doncaster one day and I said to an Irishman I said Jesus I bought this horse today a lovely horse I said but he's got no book in other words, he's got no pedigree. Harvey I mean, Laddie said, you cannot train a book. <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, we spend some time with him. He's a very, very good horse. So that, that's the way life is. So you trust your, your eye, basically. Yeah. Let your eye be your guide, your pocket, your judge, and the money, the last thing you part with. And you had quite a few thoughts about things that could be improved in terms of racetracks, in terms of racing. If, if you were in charge of the game, and I... I said you could change something, what would you change? I would have a man going round, checking all the grounds, the good grounds. Okay, you've got your course inspectors, but unless there's two goes and talks to a clerk of the course and say, no, look here, you've got to do something with this ground. And there's, you know, the sort of poo-poo because, oh, it's our race track, we'll do as we like sort of thing. Whereas, if somebody in authority, especially if you had a, an inspector and a vet with him, and they walked on the course and they said, this isn't fit for racing today, and that man wrote it down as a vet, MRCVS, in my opinion, this track isn't fit for racing, they couldn't race because every insurance company would be around the necks. So it, it needs just, a, I don't mean a lot of power, but it needs just a little power to put them right they need all racetracks, in my opinion, to go and spend some money on buying equipment to get the tracks in order. You've seen our gallops this morning. I can have them perfect 365 days a year. So I'm sure a racetrack that has nothing else to do should be able to get perfect going. They need somewhere where the book stops. And unfortunately with the BHA, the book never stops. You know, you go and ask, ask somebody, oh, that's not my job. Oh, that's not my job. They must get organised to get some authority going round the wrist traps.
you're a, a rider first and foremost, Harvey, have been throughout your life. So when you work with jockeys, what, what are you looking for in a rider? Balance, number one. I've had some very good jockeys. I've had jockeys that's been washed up and got them back again. I've had jockeys come here and they turn around and said to me, I wish they'd come here 20 years since. Here with all them fences, they can get the practice. A lot of these lads, they don't get the practice over fences. And okay, they get half the claim out and then they pack the job in because they're getting hurt. They get hurt because they don't know what they're doing. I mean, modern thing is today, they go to racing school, go get themselves a job for a month or two, have a ride, and then, oh, oh I'm a jockey. So then they go and get a car, get an agent. They forget work, they forget what's made them. How big a part do you think you, you and Harvey have played in, in various jockeys' careers along the way? There's been quite a few jockeys that have gone on, you know, that have gone from here. Dominic Ellsworth, obviously, was here as a very young lad and he went on to be a, a good jockey. Uh, Jim Crowley is another one. Uh, he did us proud, really, and, and I mean, he's gone doing great things on the flat and he always was a little fella, so it's not a big deal for him, I don't think, to keep his weight steady. Um, we had Seamus Durack, uh, Warren Marston. Um, no, they've all been good for us, all in their turn. They've all, all been good jockeys for us. Well, maybe you've been good for them. Maybe. Yeah, it works both ways. Of course it does. Sue and Harvey Smith's combined expertise and experience covers horsemanship, ground management, the mentoring of jockeys, jumping technique for both horse and rider, the ability to spot talent, often on a shoestring budget, and bringing that talent all the way to the highest level. And in 2013, all of these elements came together in a once-in-a-lifetime alignment in the shape of Aurora's encore, who won the greatest race on earth, the Grand National. I bought him out of Doncaster for nine grand. Young horse, unbroken. Complete freak, complete fluke. But he was bred to win a derby. He's only 16 hands. So th this is the way the cookie crumbles. So if we're honest, when you bought that horse, you, what, you, you, you liked the look of him, but you wouldn't have necessarily thought he was going to be in. The minute I bought him and people come and saw him, they wanted to give me profit on him straight away. I said, no, no, I'll take my chance with him. But once I bought him, the mine, are you with me, until I'm ready to sell him. He went through all the novice stage. He won, um, I think he won a bumper. I'm not sure, I can't remember. Um, and he won his hurdles. And then when he graduated to chasing, you know, bit by bit, he, uh, he really became a, a smashing horse and very consistent little horse. The, the year that you won the Grand National, that winter, 12 into 13 was not a kind winter, so? No, uh, we'd had an awful lot of snow, which was actually unusual for us. We don't usually, during the winter, get a huge amount of snow, but this particular time, I think, was three weeks to a month before the National, and we really did have a lot. There were drifts, uh, the village was cut off, um, um, a huge amount of snow. Uh, fortunately, we have the indoor school, so we kept going in there until Harvey could get us a, uh, a track on the land on top of the snow, which we kept going. So you're working on top of the snow? Yeah. Um, you couldn't go on the gallop because obviously you were hitting drifts over walls and things like that. But um, that's what we, we kept going on top of the snow in the indoor school. Uh, obviously we were getting a fair amount of work into them, but not like a really solid gallop that you'd, you'd want to do. Um, thank goodness that Weatherby was on, um, and they allowed us to have a, a race course gallop, which really put a spot on. Was the Grand National always on the agenda, the, the, the sort of the one race that you'd want to win? Well, I think uh, everybody either wants to win a Gold Cup or a Grand National, and uh, we had the two horses in it that year. Um, we knew that Aurora's encore would stay. Uh, it was just whether he coped with the fences, really. We'd schooled him and everything. But he was that type of a horse that he was such a tough little character. When I watched him work three or four days before, and I watched the way Aurora's encore worked, and I said, he'll win that national. And uh, on the day, everything was very quiet. 
And Sue said, what are you going to tell him? I said, all I'm going to tell him is kick him down to Beaches. So that's all I told him. And she said to Ryan, right, what are you going to do? He said, I've got a plan in my head. I don't want to know anything else. She says, right, lad, get on with it. And he went out and did a proper job. A proper job. But like all brave lads, he went one step too far. He went to Exxon the following day with his ear o and his head as big as a bucket, finished up upside down in air ambulance and carted off. So Ted Williams once said to me, he said, OK, lad, today you're a star. Tomorrow you might be a falling star. And sure enough, I had us off him called Montana. And I won one day and I beat Ted Williams, which I liked because he had it and he couldn't get it going. And that's what he said to me that day. One day, lad, he said, you're a rising star. He said, tomorrow you might be a falling star. And next day, it went out with the dirty pig at first fence. Put his head down and shot me straight over the first fence. So, <laughs> Williams was right. So Ryan gave it a great ride. Topping ride. A real topping ride. And uh, that was that. was that. When we came back, we went onto the pub and had a bite to eat. And that was a total of the celebrations. Because don't forget, all our lives, We've been used to going out, going to shows, going to races, winning big things. It was just another day's work. Was it? Was it not a bit different? No. The Grand National was just another day's work. Same as any race is another day's work. There's achievements and disappointments. And if you have disappointments, you pick yourself up and go again next day. And if you have a high day, you get your jacket off and go and grab for the next day. Do you, do you not give yourself, though, a bit of time to enjoy that, the big successes, whether it was show jumping for you or whether it's a Grand National. You want to take a, a minute just to think, I've cracked this, I've done it. That's history. That's history. Tomorrow is the future. And that's the way people should look at life. Look forward into tomorrow, into the future.